Hey there, art nerds. I've got another watercolor tutorial for you guys today. So today we're going to be painting this beautiful Lilliputian lady hanging out with her adorable mouse friend. I am using some techniques that I first explored in another tutorial that was for patrons only. So if you're curious about that, I hope you'll join me over on Patreon at patreon.com slash soup. This is an older illustration in that it was sketched and inked a couple years ago and I'm finally getting around to painting it. And I'm so glad that the paper didn't start to degrade over time because that can definitely happen with watercolor paper, which is why I recommend you guys use it before you lose it because art supplies do spoil. They do have a shelf life. And I know it's very easy for us to just think of these things as these precious objects that we're gonna save for the day we're good enough. But frankly, if you don't use them, you'll never become good enough. And if you don't use them, they'll go to waste. So I am glad that this illustration waited for me. It didn't spoil, it didn't degrade, and I'm excited to share it with you guys today. So we are starting with an inked illustration. This was inked on Langton Prestige Cotton Rag Watercolor Paper. This is block bound, so I don't need to do any stretching. I don't need anything to secure it in place. And it was originally inked with a Sakura Pigma FB brush pen. This is a waterproof and alcohol marker safe brush pen. And if you are looking for a great art brush pen, the Sakura Pigma line is really just fantastic. So I am starting by mixing up the colors that I'm gonna to wanna to use for my background wash. And I also applied some clean water around her face, not on her face, but around her face. This is going to allow the watercolor that we're applying right now to kind of diffuse softly into the face, but not covering up the face. So it's gonna allow us to get kind of a softer wet into wet without having to worry about what we're gonna do with these colors. And I am using a hot pink. I am using, I wanna say, of ultramarine and I'm using a really really light pink for this and the palette that you guys see here is what I call the Naomi palette these are colors that work really well for the character Naomi in my comic 7 inch Kara so they're bright fun saturated colors some of them require a little bit of special use some of them have some interesting granulation properties or they may be a bit more opaque so I don't have them in my regular palette because they're not necessarily colors that are great for mixing but they're still really helpful and this palette just like my Daily Driver watercolor palette is a mix of whatever I like. There's Holbein, there's PWC, there's Kusakabe, there's Winsor & Newton. Just basically any bright neon -y or opaque colors end up in this palette. So once that base layer had a chance to dry, I activated some, gee, that looks like ultramarine blue, a very light version of ultramarine blue and I'm using that to paint the shadows on the white flowers. Now not all of these flowers are going to be white. Some of them are going to be yellow, some of them are going to be orange, and some of them are going to be white. So for the rose leaves I am starting with a cooler yellow and I'm going to use that on some of the flowers in the background as well. And while this might seem like I'm using a lot of colors, I do try to limit my color palette and I do try to use the same colors over and over and over again, just in different forms. And I find that that helps me kind of unify my illustrations, despite having maybe an excessively large collection of watercolors. So as somebody who loves to paint, I love painting watercolor illustrations. I paint watercolor comics. I also review a lot of watercolors and I have shared a lot of watercolor tutorials here on the channel. So if you're interested in watercolor and you're not really sure where to start, I have a lot of playlists that are just what you're looking for and I'll link those down in the description below. So to color her eyes, I started with a light wash of ultramarine. This is just to color the whites of her eyes. I find that this makes the eyes look more natural in the head when you put some shadow on them. And now I'm working with a warmer yellow, almost like a very light orange to paint the remainder of the flowers. So for the leaves, I'm painting a wash of a phthalo blue. So this is kind of a cooler influence blue on top of that yellow. And once that has a chance to dry, that's gonna be a really nice fresh green color. <laughs> 
That's called optical mixing, where you basically layer one layer of watercolor on top of an already dry layer of watercolor. And it can be a really great way to achieve colors that feel a little bit more vibrant, feel a little bit more fresh than colors you might mix in your palette wells. Now to mix it up and keep things fresh, for the background leaves, I'm doing the reverse. So I'm starting with a phthalo blue. It's kind of a really bright, cool blue. And then I'm gonna layer the yellow on top of that. So your order of operations can make a really big difference in how the end colors turn out. And I'm gonna do this for almost all of the leaves in the background. And in some of them, I'm gonna do a little bit of extra wet and wet by dabbing in a slightly more saturated mix of that same blue, just to kind of create some shadow at the base of the leaves. So since the rose leaves were a bit too blue for me, I'm going to add another layer of yellow on top of them and then I'm going to add that same yellow to the leaves that I already painted blue in the background. So for the olive crown style leaves, the vignette style leaves, I'm using Daniel Smith's Undersea Green to paint those. And that's one of my favorite colors. On a cold press watercolor paper like this, you get some really lovely granulation where the different colors start to separate out a little bit. So for the roses, I want to maintain kind of the bright, fresh pinks that I've got going on in the background. So I'm starting with that same super light pink, and I'm going to dab in some opera rose here and there to get a really nice mottled effect. So I'm going to be doing it petal by petal, and I'm going to really utilize the absorbency of this paper and how long this paper stays open, which means it allows wet into wet blending, it allows for color movement. So you can see I'm just dabbing in some of that opera rose around the edges of the petal to get this really fun modeled effect and like I said I'm gonna do that petal by petal so it does take patience and you don't necessarily want to do two petals that are too adjacent that are two on top of each other because since we're adding that color along the edge I don't necessarily want it in the center of the flower at this time And I'm going to use this same technique for all the little roses in the background. <laughs> 
you can really see how a layer or two of yellow on top of phthalo blue really changes the color and really creates this nice fresh green. This is a favorite technique of mine when I'm painting foliage just to kind of keep things moving, keep things interesting, to liven things up. It's a fun change of pace and I think that it kind of allows you to vary the kind of greens you can get very easily. So I've got the background pretty well established. I'm going to start now painting the interior. And since she's a darker skin character, I found that doing under glazes of blushes and shadow colors before I apply the actual skin tone is really, really helpful. And it helps me achieve the look that I want. If you're interested in learning more about painting different types of skin tones, I have a few tutorials that I hope you guys will check out. I'll link those down in the description below. But I'm starting with Alizarin Crimson and I'm using that to paint the lips, beneath the nose, across the cheeks, the eyelids, underneath the eyebrows, the interior of the ears, where the head meets the neck, and basically any areas where skin overlaps skin or any areas where you think blush would look good. I'm also mixing up a shadow color that I'm going to use on not only her skin, but also in her hair, just to kind of help establish some contrast and add in some different colors. So if you guys remember the beginning of the, vi the video, she has really dark, dark brown, almost black hair. And you probably wouldn't think that I'd used purple as a base for that, but it works really well for adding kind of a cool undertone that makes the hair feel more realistic and less like coloring book and I say that because I feel like for a long periods of time even my watercolor art kind of fell into this coloring book thing where I wasn't necessarily taking as many risks as I should have when it came to watercolor or trying new things so I'm a bit reticent to try new things it's hard to get me to take big risks so with my art I try to do something especially if it's not a commission or it's not a comic page necessarily I'll try to do one thing that's a little like ooh, I don't know how that's gonna turn out with each illustration and that way I'm kind of building up this library of fun additional tricks that can really help liven up a piece so I'm going to use this purple not only in her hair, but I'm also going to use it um, probably slightly adjusted with a little bit more red since it's a very cool purple for skin tones. But um, I'm going to use this to help shade her skin as well. And I lied, I actually grabbed a warmer purple, still pretty dark, but much warmer, much more like a shadow color for skin. And I'm using that in basically any area where I would want shaded. And I found that doing this sort of underpainting, especially for darker skin tones, allows me to control the contrast and I'm not fighting to keep the skin tones consistent as much as I used to.
So once all the underglazes are established and they've had a chance to dry, I'm mixing up her skin tone using a few different browns. And I'm going to just apply this all over at first since this is a base color. And you can really see how those underglazes influence that base color. If you want to, you could just leave it like this. You don't necessarily have to do a bunch more layers to build up those blushes, to build up that contrast. So it's really up to you. But I like this method and I think it's a very flexible method that works well when painting characters when painting portraits but particularly when painting comic pages because it's something that produces predictable results time and time again which can be really important when you're trying to paint the same character consistently over several hundred pages of comic. So now that I've got her skin tone established, I'm going to use the same color as a base for her hair. And I am leaving some highlights and I have watered it down a bit so that it's not as opaque because I do want that purple to shine through quite a bit. After that application, I just dive into it which I'm with a much darker, thicker mix of color. So for the mouse, I really want to capture that soft look of fur. And this illustration was inspired by Chica Umino's illustrations. I was a big fan of Honey and Clover back in the day. And I love the way she draws animals just ridiculously shoujo. So I'm starting with a mix of burnt umber, I believe, with some Payne's Ray so that we get kind of this mousy brown color. I'm also adding in some pink on the nose and the tail. And while I wait for that to dry, I'm gonna start painting in her clothes. So I, as with many of my illustrations, sometimes I just can't decide what colors, what I wanna do with the clothes that my characters are wearing. So I will paint basically everything else and then go with something that adds some contrast or adds some interest. And this method doesn't always work in my favor, but it can be a useful method for, you know, when you're kind of stuck. So to kind of help create the illusion of fur, I'm using a much darker, much browner mix, and I'm using these really short little brush strokes to imply fur. And then I'm blending it out as it approaches the light source so that it doesn't become too heavy or too stodgy. 
And like I've mentioned in some of my other watercolor tutorials, I do try to work on everything at the same pace. In this instance, I mostly finished the flowers in the background uh, before painting anything else. But in general, I'm kind of trying to keep the character and the mouse rendered at about the same pace because this is really going to help me better gauge the contrast, where I'm putting in shadows, and where I'm putting in details because all of that draws the eye. Areas with great amounts of contrast are going to draw the eye, whether it's a lot of details like, like little hair strokes or like something really well rendered against things that are like basically black or white, just blank page or completely filled in with black page. You also have strong contrast between two colors, like two contrasting colors, like yellow and violet, or you have strong contrast like between black and white. So there's a lot of different ways to create contrast and try to draw the eye to certain areas in the image. So speaking of contrast, I decided I didn't want to draw the eye away with her clothing. I wanted the moment to be between to be between her and her pet. So for her clothing, I'm using colors that were already referenced in the background and in the flowers. So I used Rose of Ultramarine for her top, and then I'm using Ultramarine Blue for her skirt. And I'm blending it out so that we get some softer transitions and some softer blends. Now with her top, I did end up getting a little bit heavy handed with my purples and they ended up getting a little bit blue and a little bit dark, but that's fine. Um, I do kind of like how light and airy it was initially, and I kind now in post, now that I'm narrating in post, I kind of wish I'd left it like that, but you know, hindsight is 2020. Of course, you have perfect vision when you're looking back at something like this, but that's one of the things I like about narrating these after I've completed them, is it does give me a chance to kind of see what I did, think about what I might do differently, and make choices that are different in the future. So it's a way to self-critique that's still positive and still pushing me forward without getting too destructive or too depressing. So for me with watercolor, no matter how excited I am about rendering one particular thing, whether it's a face or the mouse or whatever, I try not to just hurry up and render that one thing I'm super excited about first and then try to solve the rest of it as I go along. I try to move everything along at the same speed, at the same pace. I've noticed that this reduces some of the muddiness because you don't have issues with um, a really thick application of watercolor and then you try to put a glaze right next to it and it basically bleeds out into that glaze. And it also kind of allows me to control the contrast and to control the colors that I'm building up. I also felt like the background wreath was a little bit empty after I'd finished painting it. So once I finish adding in some shadow and I'm using a bit of that dark purple to pull in some more shadow, I'm going to go in and use colors from the original flower wreath to add in just dots of color and help fill it in without it becoming too distracting or too overly rendered. So it's a bit of a cheap technique, but again, this is about contrast. What do you add detail to? What do you add interest to? And I am filling in the space and making it seem more full without really pulling away from the contrast too much. <laughs> 
So now that the watercolor is mostly done, I'm gonna use some white gouache to go in and add in some white highlights. So definitely on some of the flowers in here, and I'm also using some water to kind of blend it out so they're a little bit more diffused, but I'm also going to use it on some of the quote unquote white flowers, the blue and yellow flowers, to really make them seem more like white daisies, as well as on the characters themselves. And as is with a lot of my illustrations that started life as inked illustrations, I'm gonna go in, after I finish using the gouache, of course, I'm gonna go in with my black Sakura Pigma FB and add in some more black lines. And what that does is that allows me to adjust the contrast because if you do watercolor on top of a black and white inked illustration, it can sometimes start to look kind of muddy as you layer watercolor, opaque watercolor, on top of your black lines. And one of the ways to kind of clean it up, readjust that contrast and fix the muddiness is to re-ink it in areas where it's necessary. But I'm also adding in these just small white shoujo dots is very reminiscent of what I've seen from some of my favorite shoujo mangaka, some of my favorite creators in that art style. So that's definitely a trope and I'm definitely trying to play it up. And here it is, the finished illustration. I hope you guys enjoy it. All that's really left is to remove it from its watercolor block using a palette knife. So I would recommend you let the thing dry fully. Let it dry overnight before you attempt to remove it because that watercolor block is what's holding it stretched. It's what's holding it taut. It's keeping it from buckling up all over the place. And if you remove it too early, it can still curl up and buckle. And if you live in a particularly humid area, you do want to take care to store your watercolor illustrations where they can be flat where they have some pressure on them to help prevent them from absorbing atmospheric water, atmospheric humidity, and curling up on you anyway. So to remove this illustration from the block, I just slip a palette knife into the opening on the block and work my way around the illustration, and voila, it is now free from its confines. So that about wraps up another watercolor tutorial. If you guys are looking for some simple step-by-step -step basic introductions to watercolor materials and watercolor painting, I've got you covered. I've got some great playlists listed down in the description below where I take you through that. If you're interested in learning how to paint watercolor comics, I've got you covered there too. I've got some playlists on how to do that as well. If you enjoy comics and you enjoy watercolor, it would really mean a lot to me. If you checked out my watercolor comic, Seven Inch Kara, you can read it for free at 7inchcara.com or if you are a fan of the dead tree format you can purchase your own copies of volume one volume two and lilliputian living through the natto shop if you like what i do and you want to help me continue to do it leave a big old like maybe leave a comment let me know what you're working on if you haven't yet subscribed hit that subscribe button and click the bell notification for me and if you'd like to support me even more you can join me over on patreon at patreon.com slash natto soup where you will get early access to pretty much all the videos I make, backer exclusive videos, and printable line arts. So thank you guys so much. Here are my amazing, phenomenal, fantastic backers. It is not possible without their support, and I hope you guys have a lovely day. Bye guys!